welcome back to White Flag, everyone. We're in a season of surrender here at Renew Church. We've been making some Lenten sacrifices along the way. I hope that yours are going well and that you're keeping up with those. We have also been looking at a lot of different angles on the topic of surrender. Uh, last week, of course, was our one-year anniversary of COVID, and uh, last week we focused on weakness in surrender, and we talked a lot about, you know, just lamenting and actually, you know, taking the time to express the sorrow that we feel for things that have happened. Two weeks ago, we looked at the Apostle Paul's teaching, where he talked about obedience in surrender. And if you remember, the Apostle Paul used all kinds of different terms. He used the term slave and bought, showing this possession. But then he also used terms like dead and crucified and living sacrifice. He really used the strongest terms possible to illustrate the level of surrender that we are supposed to demonstrate toward God. So our concept of surrender hopefully is deepening as we progress through this series. I hope that you're seeing this. Each week, we're kind of adding a new layer to this. And I hope that you're seeing that those Lent sacrifices that you're making, they are a good start, but they're really just scratching the surface. They're just a beginning of what biblical surrender is talking about. See, guys, the idea of biblical surrender, it's not just about surrendering certain things or activities. It's really about surrendering to God and his will for us in all things constantly. See, I can surrender a certain thing that I enjoy for a period of time. I'm doing that during this Lent series uh, season as well, but there's nothing absolute about that. You know, it's a sacrifice that you make, but surrender, it's a different thing. Surrender is basically sacrifice with the ends kicked out, right? There's no beginning, there's no end. It's, it's indefinite. So it's a much bigger thing. Today, guys, we're going to look at what Jesus actually taught on the subject of surrender. And you're going to see that Paul was really drawing on what he had already learned from Christ, that surrender was literally at the heart of everything that Jesus taught. So our theme here in week six is Jesus' teaching on surrender. You know, Jesus did so much teaching on the subject that we could actually spend all of our time today just looking at verses that really, you probably already know or at least have heard of before. And instead of that, what I want to do is I want to kind of synthesize Jesus' teaching on the subject and then spend some time really challenging your thinking on the topic, okay? So let's look at kind of some big themes that we see in Jesus' teaching. First of all, this idea of take my yoke upon you. We've talked about this already in the series. This is in Matthew chapter 11, that metaphor of putting the yoke and of being bound together with Christ. And so that's the first big idea that we see. Another big popular idea is this one of losing your life to find it. And combined with that is the idea of denying yourself. You can see there's a whole bunch of different passages that really talk about this. Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Whoever saves their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life will find it. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Anyone who hates their life will keep it eternally. Now, with that idea of hating your life, it's not like, whoa, I hate my life, right? It's, it's the idea of rejecting your life in favor of the life that Christ wants you to have. And the invitation of Christ uh, really did not look like what we see from prosperity preachers today. Like, come to Jesus and you will get everything that you ever wanted. Like, that really is not what you see when you study the Gospels. That is a corruption of the Gospel message. Dietrich Bonhoeffer actually had it right in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. He said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Now, if you know anything about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who lived during the Second World War, you know, those words actually ended up being prophetic for him. He was very vocal against Hitler's euthanasia program, against his genocide of the Jews. And when an assassination attempt against Hitler failed, he was accused as being part of the people that, you know, initiated that. And soon afterward, he was hanged by the Nazi party, April the 9th, 1945. And so this whole idea of lose your life to find it, you know, Bonhoeffer is one of the still today most prominent voices when it comes to the Christian community and this idea of sacrificing for Christ. Well, the next thing we see here with Jesus is the first being last. This is a theme again that we see repeated in multiple places. 
Um, and Jesus was using this teaching in a couple of different ways. He, he was using it nationally to challenge the Jews who really saw themselves as being first as it relates to God and who were now going to be seeing the Gentiles put ahead of them. But he also uses it personally to show how surrender actually elevates us in the long run. And this was a radical teaching that Jesus was giving to put others ahead of oneself, right? The golden rule was connected to this line of thinking. And then another big thing that we see is the greatest being the greatest servant. If you want to measure who's actually the greatest, like Jesus said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. And that the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we see numerous times and places where Jesus' own disciples were jockeying for, for position, trying to be the greatest, trying to one-up the other guy, even looking to see who was going to be the greatest in Christ's kingdom. But Jesus repeatedly corrected them. He said that they weren't supposed to be like the political and religious leaders that they saw and that they knew in their day. So that's kind of a quick summary, a quick overview of the sort of categories of Jesus' teaching as it relates to surrender. Um, you know, bind yourself to Jesus, deny yourself, lose your life, finish last to finish first, and be least to be the greatest. These are the big themes that Jesus taught. And many of them are the same themes that we see Paul teaching, right? Self-denial, reversal of importance, and death to self. What we see very quickly is that Jesus' teaching runs completely contrary to the self-actualization narrative that we've really bought into today in North America. Think about the things that we've actually been taught very subtly, probably very subconsciously. Don't be tied down to anyone, people will say, as opposed to the yoke that Jesus taught about. We'll hear things like, love yourself, take up your easy chair and follow your dreams. The first will be first and the last will be last, so get on top and stay on top. That's kind of what people teach us today. And anyone who wants to be great needs to take advantage of other people, eat or be eaten. And so Bonhoeffer really summarized Christ's teaching well when he said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Guys, are we really hearing what Jesus is saying here? That this life of yours your share of everything this world has to offer, right? Your dreams, your one shot to be successful, to be famous, to be powerful, to be respected. Jesus is saying, let go of it. And in the scripture we read this morning, you know, Jesus challenged this rich young man to take all of his material possessions and basically to kind of put them in this box. I'm using this illustration of a box to kind of put them in this box and then just walk away from it. Guys, we really struggle with that kind of a thought, but Jesus was actually teaching a whole lot more than just the material possessions. Jesus was actually saying so much more. He was saying to put everything in this box, our hope for pleasure, our family, our goals, our vision of success, our own reputation, put all of it in that box and then walk away. Guys, I will be the first to confess that I am not worthy to be delivering this message today. You know, I've surrendered my life to Christ, but surrendering the contents of my life is another story, something I struggle with every day. You know, we surrender our box to Jesus, our life, we say, but we have a hard time surrendering the stuff in the box, which is the real essence of our life. In the first week of the series, Pastor Wade opened the series by talking about different kinds of surrender, and he mentioned three different types. He mentioned Salvific surrender, meaning your salvation, surrendering to God in salvation. That's that initial, you know, surrender we make when we come to God. Then he talked about sanctification surrender, surrendering to God in my moral decisions and the way that I live my life, right? Being sanctified with God. But then he also talked about a third category. I don't know if this is the exact word he used, but it was basically special surrender. I wanted to keep the alliteration going. So, but this special surrender, which is surrendering to God in all kinds of different circumstances as they come up day by day. So special surrender, what would we be talking about? There's a lot of different examples we could use, like maybe whether or not to move from where you live now to a different place, whether to stay at a job or not, 
whether to go back to school and get more education or whether to buy a new car or not. These could be the types of decisions that you want to act out of surrender and each one of these is an opportunity to show surrender, but it's complicated, right? You come up against decisions like that and you're not exactly sure what to do. We tend to think about things like, well, how will it affect me, right? How will it affect me? And then maybe secondly, how will it affect all of the people connected to me, my family, the people that you know, are gonna kind of get pulled into this decision? But think about it, guys. We, we really ought to think about bigger questions. Like, first of all, what does God think about it? And how will it benefit God's kingdom? Now, I know we all kind of know this, but we often fail to look at these decisions so clearly when we're talking about surrender. And even when we're determined to see these decisions in a spiritual light, sometimes it's just really hard to separate what is best for me and what is best for God's kingdom in these decisions. And I can tell you from experience, it takes great humility and great self-awareness to make good decisions in these areas. It takes a lot of clarity of spirit a clarity that really only comes through spending time in prayer and before God and with his spirit. So note this, guys. The big point that Jesus is making in all of this teaching is that our own drive to maximize our own lives and to fulfill our own dreams is the very thing that stands in the way of us It's experiencing a fulfilling life as God intended it. Are you getting that? It's all of this stuff of our own that's getting in the way. Paul pointed out that although we are free, we very easily become slaves to our own desires. We looked at this two weeks ago, and Paul's usage of that term slave as a metaphor comes in very handy for understanding how we are supposed to live our lives. Consider that metaphor for a second, right? The, the, the term slave. You know, when you think about it, a slave owns nothing, right? He has nothing of his own. He has no vision for his own life. Like, why would you have a vision for your own life? The best that the slave can really do is to make his master's goals his own goals and to live for the purposes of his master. You see where we're going with this? Now, in fairness, he can also choose to resent his master if he wants and to put in the minimum effort, just enough to avoid rebuke or punishment, and then spend all of his time thinking about all of the things that he could do if he was a free man. But really, that sounds very depressing, doesn't it? And very spirit crushing. But here's the thing, remember, we talked about this two weeks ago. When Paul talks about being a slave to Christ, it is always voluntary. And so what he wants us to do is to compare slavery to Christ with slavery to ourselves and to the world and to choose wisely. What kind of slavery are we going to choose? And his desire is that after thinking about it, we would choose him joyfully. Just like that merchant that Jesus talked about who found this pearl of great price and joyfully went and sold everything that he had to get that field and to procure that pearl. Now, I mentioned two weeks ago that sometimes I don't think people really know what they're signing up for when they decide to follow Jesus. And I think that this is a problem. Jesus really encouraged people to count the cost of their decision. If you really study the Gospels out, he really encouraged this idea of counting the cost. And he gives us freedom to choose him, but we are choosing him as our father, as our king, as our master, forever. Like, think about this, guys. And so note, people often lack the proper time of reflection and reckoning that Christ recommends prior to following him. This is just a fact. And if you're going to become someone's slave for life, I think you really ought to think it through properly first. This is a huge decision that you're making. Jesus taught that there is a high cost of being his disciple. In fact, I want to read for you this morning what he says in Luke chapter 14. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, Yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king 
is about to go to war against another king? Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace, right? He's going to try to make a deal if he can't, you know, estimate that he has the ability to follow through. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything that you have cannot be my disciples. So guys, Jesus really pushes us to count the cost. Sometimes we wrongly assume that he's pushing us this way because because he just desperately needs us to serve him. And we know that that's not true. God is self-sufficient. He doesn't need us for anything. So I ask you, what if, guys, this pressure is actually for our benefit, not God's? This is a powerful thought. Think about this. What if you surrendering yourself to God automatically steered you toward realizing your highest self-actualization? Think about that. What if this decision to surrender fully not only benefited God's kingdom, but it equally benefited you, your level of happiness, your level of fulfillment in your life? You see, if we really believe that God does everything and makes everything for a purpose, we say that we do, but if we really believe that, and if you really believe that he made you unique and he intended for you to be part of his body, the church, to do his good work in the world, then think about this, guys then leaning into building God's kingdom in whatever way comes natural to you is the key to you reaching your fullest potential and fulfillment. See, once again, when God calls us to surrender, it's not give up on making goals. That's not what he's saying. It's make the kingdom of God your goal. He doesn't say, let go of everything. He says, take hold of that for which I took hold of you. See, surrendering to God and his kingdom work is the key to your fulfillment. Jesus called it losing your life for his sake. And guys, I'm telling you, it is the key to finding real life. This is not a new concept, guys. In case you're not aware of this, way back in Psalm chapter 37, right? The psalmist says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Those things that are truly deep inside you that will make your life joyful and fulfilling. Well, guys, there's a lot of concepts here. I want to try to make this practical for you, and I want to use a little illustration here to do that. We discussed earlier how it's very difficult sometimes to separate our own desires from God's desires. Like when you're actually deciding to surrender, how do I know what is you know, just my desire and what is God's desire? We want to surrender, but we're not sure what to give up and what we're actually supposed to pursue. And the difficulty arise, arises rather when our own dreams and vision are not aligned with God. So I want to use this little example here this morning of like two ladders. And one ladder is, it represents the desires of self, and the other ladder represents the desires of God, right, on these two different sides. And by the way, having these two ladders, as you can already see, this is what Jesus called having two masters, okay? Um, It's two different paths and we're trying to follow them both at the same time. Now, typically what people do is people climb their own ladder saying, you know what, someday when I get to the top of my ladder, then I will jump over to God's ladder, right? You you understand how people do this? They say things like, when I become wealthy, then I will give more money to the poor and to God's work, right? When I become famous, I will use my celebrity to point people to Jesus, When I find real happiness of my own, then I will share that happiness with others. But guys, when we're honest, we all know that that's not really how it works. First of all, we tend to spend all of our time on ourselves, and the truth is we may not succeed in those things that we're trying to do, and so there's no guarantee of that. And then secondly, if we do succeed, what happens so often? Very often we forget God completely. Now, there are other people who climb the ladder, um, but they don't properly consider how God made them. They climb God's ladder even, right? The desires that God has for them. But they haven't really thought about how God made them and their natural passions and abilities to further God's kingdom. And so even though they're kind of, you know, climbing this ladder and trying to pursue the, the dreams that God has for them, they're spending a lot of their time looking over to the other ladder, 
right? And they're saying things like, well, you know, I wish that I could have any job that I wanted, but I, you know, I'm doing this thing for God, so I can't do that. Or I wish that I could live wherever I wanted and move wherever I wanted to be. Or I wish that I got to do more of the things that I enjoy, right? And so they're spending all the time looking over at the ladder of the desires of self. And it may look more noble that they're kind of climbing this ladder, but it's really not any better when they're spending all of their time looking over at the other one. So in a very practical sense, guys, how do we surrender properly? And I want to suggest three things here. First of all, we have to align the two ladders. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 6, 24. He's, he talks about the fact that you can't serve two masters. You'll love one and hate the other. And so this is a beautiful picture. We have to take those two ladders that we talked about and bring them together. We need to align the two ladders, God's desires and my desires, and bring them into alignment with each other. That's the first thing that we need to do. You can't have two masters. That's what Jesus taught in Matthew 6. Then the second thing we need to do is we need to seek first the kingdom of God. In Matthew 6, that's what he said. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Once your ladders are aligned, you can climb God's ladder and automatically be climbing your own as well. Your pursuits are aligned. And the things that you desire to do are the same things that God desires to do. Then the third thing is you should start contributing to the kingdom of God today in whatever way comes naturally. And you see this again in that same passage in Matthew chapter six, a few verses down, what does Jesus talk about? He says, stop thinking about tomorrow and start acting on today. It's all there in the same passage. So in Matthew 6, Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be added to you as well. You need to understand the all these things if you look at that passage, is all of the things that the pagans run after, Jesus said. Now that included food and it included clothing, but it's all of the other stuff as well, guys. And on top of that list is our own happiness. It's our own fulfillment. You think about the stuff that we spend our time chasing and what people in our culture spend their time chasing. That's what we're going after. So note this, the biggest choice of surrender that I will make today is whether to use my time and energy on my own happiness or on God's happiness. That's so important that you get that. Guys, every time we choose, it's an act of faith and it's an act of surrender. You can think about Jesus in this situation. He had to do the exact same thing. As the son of God, he knew that he alone could do certain things. You ever take the time to consider this? Right? Jesus was able to heal people, so he did. He spent time healing people. Jesus was able to reveal deeper truths about God in a way that no one else could because he understood the scriptures and that they were about him. And so he did. He spent time revealing truth to people. And the big one, we know that he alone could offer his life as a sacrifice for sin on the cross. And so he did. He did what God purposed for him to do, what he alone could do in his context. And look at how the writer to the Hebrews described this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse two. He says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Guys, I hope that you're catching what this verse is saying. Are you really catching it? It's saying that Jesus' path of joy and fulfillment, right? For the joy that was set before him, it was the path to the cross. That was his path to self-actualization. It was him surrendering to God what he alone could surrender to God. You know, I see these memes that go around online sometimes and I, I got thinking this would be a great meme. It's not a funny meme, but I think it would be a great meme. This is Jesus' picture of self-actualization. You ever think about that? Christ on the cross is the greatest image of true self-actualization that you will ever see. Now that blows people's minds to think that's self-actualization. Yes, sacrificing yourself completely, full surrender. It was radical surrender, unlike we've ever seen or will ever see again. And it was the complete alignment of Jesus' gifts and God's kingdom together. Guys, I have to ask this as we close today. What if we caught on to radical surrender? What would happen if our church really caught on to this? 
You know, maybe you're good at business. What if you actually tried giving like 25% of the profits from your business away to charity, to mission? What if you actually tried that? That's radical stuff. Maybe you just love to cook, right? God just made you this way. You love to cook. You're good at it. What if you made a meal for someone outside of your home once every week this year? Every week of the year, 52 extra meals that you give away. What if you love sports and, you know, maybe for you it would be like hosting people at your own home for every Leafs home game. Once things allow, right, with the regulations, we're getting back to it hopefully. But what if you did something like that? These are the kinds of practical surrender that we need to start with. We're not talking about surrender from something, but surrender to God's plans and to God's purposes. Guys, I can't help but thinking, and I really believe this, if we took a chance on radical surrender, God would continue to steer us into the places that used our gifts even more and brought us even more joy in our lives. You see, our tendency is to wait until we have what we want, right? We climb our own ladder until we see our own desires met, but that's not how Jesus lived. In fact, we see a great example of it in John chapter four. Jesus was there, he's talking with this Samaritan woman that he just met. His disciples, you know, they realize, man, we're gonna need some food. So they actually go into the town to get some lunch and hours later they come back and they see Jesus and Jesus still hasn't eaten anything. And Jesus makes this amazing statement. He says, guys, I have food to eat that you know nothing about, right? He's talking about fulfillment. That is the key to fulfillment, guys. It's losing your life to find it. Next week, Pastor Andrew is going to show us some more how Jesus not only taught about surrender, but he modeled it for us. He lived it for us. It's going to be Palm Sunday. It's going to be great. Don't miss it. Don't miss it.